Hello, everyone. We'll get started in just a moment. I'm just gonna give a few minutes for everybody to log in and get situated. While we're waiting, you can look on the panel at the bottom where it says handouts and you can download the handouts associated with this presentation. You will see a one pager for Human Trafficking Legal Center and the services that we provide. You can also see um, some information on Survivor Alliance, our partner in this webinar series. And you'll also see the PowerPoint presentation for this webinar as well as an agenda. So while we're waiting, we're going to wait about one more to two more minutes. You guys can go ahead and download those things. And we'll start in just a moment. Okay, let's begin. Hi everybody, my name is Roxy Farrow. I'm the operations manager and the lead of the Survivor Leadership Program here at the Human Trafficking Legal Center. Um, I would like to welcome everyone to this webinar on US expungements and vacatures um, and welcome our presenters, Melissa Smith, as well as Jessica Keaton. Um, just some housekeeping before we begin. If you want to ask a question, there is a question box Feel free to type any questions throughout the presentation that you have to our presenters, and we will either ask them during the presentations, but then we will have a, a time at the end of the presentation where um, some of the questions will be asked and you'll have an opportunity to get an answer. Um, as I mentioned before, if you weren't here, there are handouts associated with this webinar you can download. Um, that's under the handout section. So during the webinar please feel free to download those things so that you can have them for later or you can share them with another survivor okay um before i pass the mic along to melissa and jessica i just wanted to see survivor alliance had anything to anyone here from survivor alliance no okay well i'm going to give a quick overview of survivor alliance they are a survivor-led organization for survivors um, and they do all sorts of things create a huge community for survivors including educational resources training on survivor leadership as well as allies training for those who want to be a part of the movement if you want to learn more there are other handouts connected to the webinar and you can download that and go to the website and learn more about their organization so without further ado i will go ahead and pass the mic along over to melissa so that we can start Hi, my name is Melissa. Um, I am a survivor um, here to talk to you today about um, criminal record uh, expungement and vacature. Um, and I'll send it over to Jessica. Great. It's my, oh, trying to share my, give me one minute, a little bit of technical difficulty. I'm trying to share my PowerPoint. Okay. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. Let's see. Okay, Roxy, is that showing now? Yep, I can see everything. Great. Good to Hi, go. everybody. My name is Jessica Kitson. I'm Senior Managing Attorney at Volunteer Lawyers for Justice, which is a legal services organization in New Jersey. I also co-lead the Survivor Reentry Project, which is a project of um, Freedom Network USA, and the project is specifically geared towards 
um, providing training and technical assistance and so support specifically to survivors on criminal record clearing. And so I'm really excited to be with you today. I'm especially excited to be doing this with Melissa, who will tell you in a little bit about how she became the first person in New Jersey to get relief under New Jersey's um, vacature law. Uh, you'll see that I put the title here as criminal record clearing because I think sometimes we can get so caught up um, with the words expungement and vacature um, that it can get really tricky. And so really just to be clear, what we're going to talk about today is how to clear your record using laws specifically designed for survivors of trafficking um, in recognition um, of the, the likelihood really that those um, th that the trafficking can lead to a criminal record. Um, and in in reality, the um, National Survivor Network did a survey in 2016, which gave us some pretty stark information about why we have a need for this work. So that survey showed us that out of the all of the respondents, 91% reported having been arrested at some point. Over 50% reported that every arrest on their record was related to their trafficking experience. 42% were arrested as minors. Over 40% reported being arrested over nine times or more, and 60% reported being arrested for crimes other than prostitution. And so with statistics like these, um, it really does show that if we do not address the criminal records that survivors are left with, it makes it virtually impossible uh, and Melissa is going to talk to you more about that in a little bit, um, to truly move on and rebuild um, and support yourselves and your families. And so that's what really we are working on. Roxy, can you throw up the first poll that we have for today? Sure. Would you, have you ever checked your criminal record or history? Yep, yep. Yes, ma'am. So I'm going to put a poll on oh, the I'm screen. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I thought the we're doing that one second. Sorry, I got wrong. Can, okay. can we do? The, yes. It doesn't matter. We can do the other one. Okay. Okay. I'll have the second one in just a moment. So we're going to do a quick poll. I'll put the poll on the screen and everyone has the opportunity to click the answer that best least, uh, relates to them. So one second, please. Right, so the question is, do you know the difference between record expungement and vacature? Um, and the reason, there we go, look at that. Not really, and that's because it's so confusing. <laughs> and I think that um, the reality is that expungement is a word that has been around for much longer. Um, the way that I'm going to use those words for the purposes of today's um, webinar is that expungement usually refers to procedures um, and relief that a lot of states have available even outside of a trafficking context. And so I'll use New Jersey as an example. In New Jersey, there are a number of um, there are a number of records that are able to be cleared through New Jersey's expungement law that are just because the law is recognizing that we want people to not have their criminal record be a bar for them to get education, to get jobs, to get housing, to get benefits, whatever it is. Um, it's, a, it's a way to sort of hide and remove those records from the public view. Vacature, on the other hand, is really designed as a way to say, you know what, these these convictions really shouldn't have happened in the first place. And if we understood trafficking then when they happened, as we do now, that person would likely not have been arrested, um, would not um, have been uh, tried and convicted or, or, or you know, um, asked to enter into a plea deal. Um, and so the idea is really to remedy that. And so vacature doesn't just hide all of that information from the criminal record. Vacature can actually undo it. It basically is, is as if a, a, um, a conviction never happened. And this is important for a lot of people. Um, it's important, honestly, for peace of mind, but it's also especially important if, um, for any foreign national survivors who um, 
their record can actually um, be a bar to helping them um, stay in the United States if that's their wish. So there are some really important distinctions between vacature and expungement. And as you're looking at maybe your own record or thinking about what relief exists in your jurisdiction, it's important to know the difference between those two things. So we have vacature laws um, now, but really where are they available and when did it start? So this is a map that shows where we began. In 2009, the state of New York became the first state in the country to offer vacature relief. Um, and it's a sad looking map, right? <laughs> this is not the map that we want. Uh, we want a map um, that really reflects the reality, which is that trafficking can exist anywhere and everywhere, and that survivors are entitled to that relief. Um, really wherever they have a record. And so this map for today looks so much better. And I'm actually realizing that I put an outdated map on here because Georgia should have the darker orange color um, as it recently has passed um, a vacature, a very good, in fact, vacature law. Um, and so you can see that in the past 11 years, we have made tremendous progress in making sure that more and more states have access, uh, survivors in more and more states have access to the relief that they need to clear their records. There is work being done in all of the states that are not orange right now to try and pass um, laws. And so if you want more information about that, or if you know you have a record or you just live in one of those states, I'd be happy to connect with you and, and try and give you a sense of, of what the work is that's being done um in 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 these various locations but we we really do want to celebrate how much progress has been made um in a relatively short period of time and the really good news is that the work um over the years has meant that the states that have um passed these laws more recently have better laws in place than the states that came on early on because we've learned so much more we understand what relief is really important to have in these laws to really provide all of the results um, that are intended. And so a, a lot of really great work has been done um, just since 2009 when this first began. And what do these laws look like? So again, it varies widely from state to state. And it's very important to know that even if you have a record that spans multiple states, as many of my clients do, that the relief is going to be state specific. And so um, the, the procedures that the, each state puts in place, as well as which um, types of convictions can be cleared, um, or if there's a waiting period, anything like that is all going to be very state specific. Um, and But generally speaking, what the laws cover, arrest records, access to court documents, and then ideally, right, vacating and reversing convictions, meaning that whereas someone was found to be guilty, that is undone. There are, um, there's also mechanisms in most states so that we can, um, if there were fines paid, um, there's the potential for getting some of those fines returned to you. Um, and again, making most important, regardless of whether or not the, the vacature means that the conviction has been undone, what we really, really want to do here is make sure that everything is hidden from public records so that it can't be used to discriminate against anyone based on, um, you know, when they're going for a job and they're going for housing, education. Um, I have a number of clients right now who are waiting for their um, orders of vacature to be finalized so that they can get their, their professional licenses um, initiated or renewed. There's a whole host of reasons that someone might want this relief, um, and the laws are really there to, to provide that. And the really good news, and what I'm going to talk to you about later on, is that we have a team of attorneys across the country who are eager um, and trained and able to help um, do a lot of this work, many times um, pro bono, so for free. Um, and we'll talk more about how you can go about accessing that relief in a little bit. But I think that the main reason you're here is really to um, talk, uh, hear from Melissa um, and let Melissa, I'll chime in um, a little bit, but really Melissa is a perfect person to talk to you about what all of this actually looks like. What are What is it like to find out that you still have a record um, after years and and try and get this fixed. Um, and in Melissa's case, she was groundbreaking because she was the first person in the state of New Jersey to get relief, um, which have been two full years after the law was enacted. That's how hard these laws are. People don't even necessarily know that the relief is available. And so Melissa has really paved the way for so many other people in New Jersey um, to get access to, to vacature. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to her and let her share a little bit about her story.
Hi again. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so um, my life started out, you know, I'll give you a little bit of a background. Um, I had a single mother who worked two jobs just to make ends meet. Um, it, it was just hard for her to, you know, to struggle. She did what she could with what she had and what she knew. Um, I had a child at a young age, I was 20 years old, um, with a man who didn't want him. Um, so therefore I was a single mother at 20 um, and I did the best I could with what I knew. Um, I moved to uh, a little place in New York, uh, worst place I could have ever moved to. I found myself uh, around the wrong people, the wrong places. I wound up getting high. Uh, I wound up in jail. Uh, I lost my son. Um, just It was just a whole big ball that just rolled out of control and I didn't know what to do. I had no one to help me. I had no family there or whatever. So um, while I was in jail, I uh, ran into a girl that I had known from the street and um, she told me that she knew somebody who could help me get my son back. and. You know, he was the best thing in the world. And, you know, he had houses and cars and lawyers and money. And, you know, he was going to help me, you know, just because he was a nice guy. Well, you know, I just lost my son. And now I'm in jail. I didn't think, you know, I didn't think, I should say, I didn't think. So over time, after, you know, talking with him while I was in jail, he agreed to pick me up. Of course, he picked me up and I didn't have to do any of those things, you know, um, for the first week or so, you know, it was just showing me the ins and outs, where I was going to be living, what I was going to be doing. Um, then uh, I went to Atlantic City and that's where everything started. Um, I saw my son a lot less. Uh, he put me to work a lot more. So I tried leaving. Um, I fled. Uh, he sent people to come and get me. Um, I came back. He had me thinking everything was okay, but that obviously wasn't the, the case. Um, I was beaten with a copper pipe, and it was just not a, a place that I wanted to be. Um, over time, uh, I did eventually leave for good. Um, I did get my son back, which was the most important thing um, to me uh, at all. And that was the only reason why I believed the things that I believed. But um, after I had left, um, I want to say I was gone about a year before I got a phone call from the FBI stating that Mr. Tompkins was um, arrested and in going to um, be incarcerated and they needed my assistance in doing so. Of course, I said, yes, let's, you know, um, I'm here to help in any way that I can. And I did. And I, I went in front of the judge in Trenton and I, I read my statement and I helped them put Mr. Tompkins away for um, a long time. And um, at that time, I was told that my record would um, be sealed and I wouldn't have to worry. So basically, in, in, in exchange for me, helping them, they were going to help me by stealing my um, prostitution record. And the only thing I would have to worry about was something that I had gotten in trouble for when I was younger. Okay, fine. Well, I years and years had gone by. Um, I had another child. Um, I was getting jobs that, you know, really didn't consist of background checks or, you know, they, they were just like, telemarketing jobs or a uh, waitress or whatever, but I really wanted to get a career. I wanted to, you know, I wanted a life that would support myself and now two children. Well, then I got pregnant with a third child. Um, and now I, I have a good job with the school and they fingerprint me just so I can keep my job. Now I wanna move further through this career in the school district but we're wondering why my fingerprints hadn't come back. And a year had gone by and they said, look, Melissa, you know, we can't keep you out without your fingerprints. All along, I was trying to find out what was taking so long. They couldn't talk to me. Come to find out, I still had this 15 
charges on my record of prostitution, trespassing, um, criminal trespassing, uh, felony prostitution, uh, you name it, I had it. Um, and I didn't know why. I didn't know how that was still possible when I was told that I wasn't going to have a record at all. So I crawled under a rock. I cried. I didn't know what I was going to do. Now everybody in my area knew the things that I had done. So that was even worse because I didn't want my background out there unless I wanted to put it out there. So now everybody knew. So I just felt some type of way. Well, I spoke with a couple of the girls that I keep in contact with and asked if they had any issue. Well, lo and behold, they had the same issue and they told me how they were able to get their records underway. And so I spoke with uh, Robin Richardson of the Urban, uh, what was it? Urban Justice, Urban Justice Center. Center. Urban Justice Center, right? And um, then she, helped me with my um, one case I had in New York. We got that one um, expunged, but I, I, and I don't think that one was vacated. I just think it was expunged. Um, and then after New Jersey, that one became vacated. But anyway, um, I worked with my lawyer there and then I was introduced to um, Jessica of Volunteer Lawyers for Justice and then um, Jeff from uh, McCarter and English. Um, I didn't really trust or believe in anything that anyone ever told me now, especially more now because of what had, had just happened. So I didn't think that anyone was going to want to help, especially in New Jersey, I had a felony. Like that wasn't just a brush it under the rug type, you know, trespass or a little charge. This one was a big one, it was a felony. And for, them, for my lawyer to say, look, these, these people want to help you and they want to help you for free. I like, no way, like that's not possible. And sure enough, um, I spoke with Jessica on the phone. Hearing her voice was so comforting and calming. I believed every word that she told me from the day I spoke to her and everything she told me that she was going to do for me, she did right down to the letter, if not more. So being but with her and Jeff was the best thing that's ever happened to me because after speaking with them, they put me on the path for Nevada and uh, Pennsylvania and all the other states that I had stuff in, charges in. So if it wasn't for them, I don't know what I would do. Um, and today I don't have a record. Huh? I will just say I will never forget that first um, that first phone call that we had. It was me, you, and and my colleague Karen, um, mm -hmm. Karen Robinson. And you know, just for background, um, and I think that folks who've done this in other states, you know, it when you're bringing the first of a case um, in a state, it's it can be tricky because you want to make sure you're bringing the right case, and you're you well, in lawyers speak, you don't want to make bad case law. So we needed to bring a case that we felt like if someone were going to object, we were in a strong position to appeal. We didn't want it to come to that, right? And we told we told you that, Melissa, right? We don't mm -hmm. we don't think there's any reason that this should be objected to. We don't think there's any reason this should be denied. But if it were to happen, we wanted to make sure that we were working with someone so that we could we could appeal it. So that the very first case had good case law right from the beginning. And, and I just want to give you so much credit, Melissa, because you were so willing to be that first person. We did not necessarily know what this was going to look like. And so we had to create papers from scratch. We had to really think about what needed to go into your affidavit. Um, and you were just so willing at every step of the way to work with us and, and, and figure that all out. Um, for those of you that don't know what we're talking about, Jeff, so McCarter and English is one of New Jersey's um, preeminent law firms. Jeff Rosman is a partner at that law firm, and they, from day one, jumped in and said, yeah, we want to do this with you. And that's been one of the magical things about working with the Survivor Reentry Project and, and doing criminal record clearing work with survivors across the country is that the response from the private bar, from, from pro bono attorneys, has just been astounding. And they really have helped to make the law in so many of these different states. Um, do you remember, Melissa, that first time that you came to meet at the law firm and you had, how many of us were in that room, right? There were like five of us in the room to meet with you. I was scared of death. 
but I, I remember I'm, uh, he asked me if I wanted some water and I said, no, I probably choke, remember? Because I couldn't swallow, I couldn't breathe, but every single word that was said to me that day made me just feel not like that we were working together to clear my criminal record. It was like we were working together to find me a job. It, it, you guys were so personable and 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 I, I can't even put words to it. I, I just never felt more comfortable, you know? And that's what made me be so, as you keep saying, easy every step of the way was because I knew that if I didn't kick and stomp and and I just did what I was supposed to and, and let you guys lead me instead of me fighting y'all, that I would be where I am today, so. But, but I, so oh. I wanna say, right, it, it, it's such a partnership. It, it's such a partnership. It is, it's one, it's, yeah, one of the best things about the connection. You need the connection. Yeah, and they're really, the, these laws are meant to be, and this, this relief is really meant to be survivor-led. We don't want it to be that anyone, whether it's the people writing the laws or the attorneys helping you, we don't want it to be that that, that someone else is dictating this. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what these petitions look like, because I think folks have a question about that, right, is usually it involves, the most important part of a vacature petition is gonna be the, the survivor affidavit. Um, and, and that's probably the hardest part of this process, right, Melissa, is really having yeah. to give your full background and go into some, you know, pretty significant detail about the trafficking. Yeah, from the trafficking. And they, they don't just want to know that. They want to know where you came from. They want to know your upbringing and how you got that way and why you got that way. And, oh, it was drugs or your mom beat you. Like, they tried to find a, a way. Like, they want to find, put a finger on how you got that way but it's really not how you got that way or why you got that way it just happened and now here we are to get rid of it like it's really no it's it, it yeah. just happens and it's and it's complicated and you know i think we've also we we the advocates who are working with survivors have learned a lot and so we I think have gotten a lot better over the years in learning to really make ourselves think critically. And, and this is in response to some clients who I think have done a really good job of pushing back and saying, why do you need to include that? Why are you giving so much detail? And so we try really hard to only provide the details that are necessary, but the, the way the laws are written is that you're, you're, you have to prove really two main things. One, that the person was a, a victim of, of human trafficking and that the record that you're trying to clear was connected to that trafficking. And so the way that we do that is through two, um, is really through that affidavit. You can include additional documents and other materials, but it's that affidavit that's really going to lay the groundwork for why the person is entitled to the relief. And so working with Melissa, right? I mean, that was, that was what we spent really the bulk of our time doing is really talking to you about what you were comfortable with including and, and how we went about framing all of that for everybody. Correct. And then getting them to even understand that, yes, okay, the, the prostitution is, is one thing. Okay, so we're going to clear that part, but we're not going to take away the trespassing because she knew better than to be in that casino. Yes, but that doesn't mean that the, the person, the pimp, didn't force us to do these things, to make us stay here and make us go here. And make it. So to get the, 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 the law to understand that we weren't doing those things by choice, we were doing them by force. That kind of helped put them under that umbrella, you know, to get those things taken away as well as, you know, just not just the prostitution charges, but the trespassing charges, the God forbid you robbed a bank, let's say, because he made you, you know, not that it would go away, but it would help you in your court cases to, you know, because those were under the my pimp made me do it type thing. But we don't want to use that as like uh, an excuse as to why, you know, but it is true. They do make you do a lot of a lot of things, you know, and I, I had uh, cell, telephone bills and, and, and uh, cable bills in my name that I, I didn't even live in those places. But I, I had to clear up my not just my criminal record, but I also had to clear up my my financial record as well because i had all these charges that weren't mine so it, and i didn't i wouldn't have known any of those things if you guys didn't tell me that as well so 
it's just the little things that you you don't think of that your lawyers definitely do. Um, an interesting, you know, another party that plays a very important role in in bigger work is the prosecutor's office. Um, oh. Again, it changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but what we have found, and Melissa, I know you have strong thoughts about this, so I want you to weigh in, but what we have found is that having a collaborative relationship with the prosecutor's office who's going to ultimately have to weigh in on these vacature petitions is very important. Mm, you definitely want the prosecutor on your side, that's for sure. That is for sure. And Miss Buckley was right there behind me a thousand percent. Oh, oh I love her. I love her. Daniel, she fought for me. Yep. She fought for me just the same as you guys did. Is it, it, She was more my lawyer than the prosecutor, it felt like, because she was objecting on her own stuff <laughs> i guess you could say <laughs> she, did. she did she joined our petition you don't yeah it's she certainly so, did she certainly did i don't want to give the wrong impression and make anyone think that going to court is a common occurrence with these petitions because it's not in most states um there is no appearance required um and even in some states um there there might be a prosecutor's interview but even that's becoming more and more rare our hope as advocates is really to push that 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 most of these can get handled how we call it on the papers so based on the petition that's filed and without anyone having to appear but again melissa's case was unique in that it was the first one in the state of new jersey um, melissa was willing and we thought it was important that we go and put as much of this on the record for the judge to make the decision as possible and so it was a pretty brief hearing but i can tell you in my years there, you really don't see every day where the prosecutor, who's technically the other party against you in a case, stands up and does a better job than you do <laughs> in really telling the judge why that why the person, why Melissa was entitled to this relief. So it was a pretty special day for that reason. Yes, it was. I cried. I cried the whole way home. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so we, we at, um, the, the, the attorneys across the country um, and, and other advocates who are, are really working on um, criminal record clearing for survivors, one of the things we focus on a lot is what that relationship looks like with the prosecutor's office, because it doesn't need to be a combative one. Um, and what we have found in New Jersey, certainly, and I think that um, this would be true in other states as well, is that where we have conversations with the um, prosecutor's office in advance and we we sort of give them a heads up about what we're doing it makes all the difference now they're constrained by the laws right and so again it really gets back to um, what i was saying earlier and that the stronger the law the easier it is and, and the biggest difference that we we are seeing from laws that were started in 2010 and 2009 2010 versus now is there's a much better recognition now that the things that are on folks record is more than just prostitution and prostitution related crime so a lot of state laws including new jersey's and new york's um, some of the early states a lot of the laws really focus on on prostitution and prostitution related crimes and so it's pretty easy to clear those things but what we know is that survivors have drug charges they have shoplifting charges um, a whole host of charges and so the really good news is that a lot of states that are newer to passing these laws are doing a much better job of of adding um, in other offenses or making it much broader and then states like new york and new jersey um, who, who did it sooner and maybe not as well initially are really looking at their laws now and, and we have pending legislation in both states to try and push for broader relief for survivors What else, Melissa? What else? What are some takeaways? What What do you wish you knew going into um, going into the process? And 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 again, like, what was it? What would you say to someone who is being placed with a pro bono team? So, you know, not a legal services lawyer like me, but they're they're being told, here we have these people at this big fancy law firm, and they're going to help you. What's What's your advice to to folks? That sounds good. Great. Sounds amazing. It does. It really does. And there isn't just going to be one that wants to help you. Like Jessica said, there's more law firms that are coming out of the woodwork that want to help. It's all about that first interaction between you and your team. I can't even just say your attorney. I have to say your team because when you meet your team, 
they're there for you. You're there to help them. They're there to help you. So if you don't have that relation, if you don't feel some type of comfort in the people that you're talking to and working with, it's not going to work. It, it has to, you have to feel comfortable with the people you're working with or you're not going to feel like I felt. You're not going to say, sure, let's put that in there. Sure. Let's do this. Sure. Let's do that. You know what you're doing because I knew that you A, didn't know what you were doing and B, I knew that the more you put, the more I would get out. So if I needed to put in things that were hurtful to me, it would open the eyes of others to see why it was hurtful to me and it would make it better for others in the long run. So anything that I could do to help the next female or male get the assistance that they needed, I was doing no matter what. So, and, and I felt comfortable with you guys. So you just have to feel comfortable with your team. If, if you don't, you don't speak, you don't open up, you don't, you don't give the information that is needed and necessary, or you stop your feet. Absolutely. I think that's such an important point. I think folks need to be comfortable. And I also want to go back to something else you said, which is that, you know, whether we should have to or not, some of the work that we're doing here is educating the court, educating prosecutor's office. And so um, you will see folks saying, listen, it shouldn't, you know, sometimes the advice from your attorney is going to be, we want to include more information than maybe we need to but because it's a real way to make sure that the, the people who are seeing this, people who are weighing in, not just on these petitions, but quite frankly, who are gonna have a survivor in front of them, not knowing that they're a survivor, the more we can do to educate them about the dynamics around trafficking and what it really looks like, the, the better served people who come after you are going to be. Now, I wanna be clear, that's not your job, right? right. And, and so you ultimately have to decide what you're comfortable with. And I think Melissa was incredibly open and was like, I wanna do this and whatever we do. I've had other survivors say to me, I'm not comfortable with that. And I want to be really clear. And I hope we did this with Melissa. I think we've probably gotten better about it since, but you are the boss. You, and, and this is true really, and should be true of any relationship you have with an attorney or an advocate is that you, you call the shots. And if you're not comfortable with something, I want to encourage you to always speak up. I want you to encourage you to ask questions, challenge us. I have learned so much more and really rethought my approach to things from my clients than so many of the other lawyers that I work with. And so I want to really encourage you to have that relationship that Melissa is talking about. And if you don't fight for it, right? Insist uh -huh. that you have a relationship that makes you feel comfortable. Yep. Absolutely, because if you don't, then they're not fighting for you. They're fighting for them and them alone. But you don't want it to be about the lawyer. You want it to be about you. That's exactly right. I couldn't have said it any better myself. That's exactly right. Um, I'm going to, I know we're, we're going to, we really want to allow a lot of questions here. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what comes next. Oh, and there's a picture. So um, that you don't know, but that's Melissa right there <laughs> talking that's with me and Jeff. Um, nice Jeff. Oh, he's so cute. Look at him. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was um, that was after it became big news in New Jersey when that. Oh, there's Miss Buckley. That's right. There's oh, that's right. That's her in the back. In the in yeah. the. Yep. Um, and then the other attorneys are are there as well. Melissa really did have a team of people um, working with her, so um, it was a really good day when this was all done. Um, a little bit about the Survivor Reentry Project. If any of you are wondering how you can access um, some of this relief, again, if you go to freedomnetworkusa.org, there's a section there about the Survivor Reentry Project. What the Survivor Reentry Project does is it provides, I actually might have a slide that says all of this. Oh, wait, before we get to that, we're going to do our second poll, right, Roxy? She's asleep. Yes, one second. Let okay. me put it up right now. Thank you. And again, if everyone can just participate really quickly, I'll leave it up for a few seconds and then I'll share the results. Okay. Okay. Let's share these results here. Look at that. Okay. So 
Some of you have already checked your criminal record history. Others have not, and others say, I don't even know where to start. And so the really good news is that what I what I want to talk to you now about is what the Survivor Reentry Project does. Um, and as you see on the slide here, it offers um, training, um, technical assistance. And by that, I mean that not only are we trying to teach other people how criminal record clearing works and how they can you know, hopefully try and make sure their states has laws or how they can use their laws to help survivors, but we actually provide technical assistance to attorneys who are doing these cases. And the reason is that we don't want people reinventing the wheel. It's not good for the attorneys, but it's really not good for the survivors who um, you know, want this done as quickly and as efficiently as humanly possible. And so um, what we offer is really a, um, the training and the technical assistance, but most importantly, a clearinghouse for survivors who want to get help with this or even just some more information. And so on the Freedom Network's um, survivor reentry page, um, you can click on it where it says technical assistance for survivors of human trafficking. If you have an arrest um, conviction history or you don't know, you can submit a confidential request on the website. And what that request is going to do is it's going to let us know that you may have a record that you want some help figuring out. And so what we will do is we will, someone from Freedom Network, after we get your form, will call you back and do a very brief, non-detailed um, questionnaire with you, just to get some basic information and make sure that what you're looking for is what we're doing. And at that point, you'll be connected with um, one of our pro bono law firm partners. We have law firms across the country who we have trained to guide you through an intake process. And what they will do is ask you questions about the timing of your trafficking in relation to what you believe your record is or is not. Um, and if you don't have your record yet, the law firms will help you get that fingerprinting, usually free of charge. Um, and so at the very least, what you're gonna do is come away with getting access to your criminal record, getting that fingerprinting done so that you have all of the details about what is out there, and then you can make an informed decision about what you wanna do with that information and whether you wanna see if there's relief available in the various states to try and clear it. And once we get that information back, so you get your fingerprinting, and once the law firm that you're working with gets it back, they will help you go through that and figure out in the, the jurisdiction, so in the states where you a, a record is showing up, whether or not there's a law in place, whether that law seems to apply to your specific circumstances, and then we try and figure out a game plan for what comes next. And if you, it looks like there's relief available, what we are trying to do, we make no guarantees, but we're pretty, <laughs> we, we have a pretty good track record, and what we're trying to do is make sure that you have the opportunity to get connected with a legal provider in that state to try and clear up the record where there is relief available. And that map showed you, right? There's relief available in so many more places now than there used to be. Um, and if not, we use it as a way to say, okay, let's connect you with folks who are trying to make um, a law a reality in those states. And so that's really the goal of the survivor reentry. We, we, we're matchmakers, um, if you will, in a way, and, and really try to make sure that we are um, making it clear to folks, um, you know, who, um, who needs the help, what help is available, um, and then putting you together. And like I said, we have law firms across the country who are taking these cases free of charge to help folks clear their records. And so if that's something that you think you might be interested in, you're going to go to this website. Again, it's freedomnetworkusa.org. Or you can just do a Google search that says Freedom Network Survivor Reentry Project, and it should take you to a page that looks like this. You're going to click on the Get in Touch at the bottom there for the technical assistance for survivors. And then it's going to bring you to a form that looks like this. The form is very, very basic. It's going to ask you for your name, email address, um, address, um, phone number. You don't have to include your, um, oh, no, I guess we did make it all required. Again, it's confidential. This form goes nowhere. Then you put in the bottom um, any information you want us to know. You can also let us know the best way for us to get in touch with you. And then from there, someone from Freedom Network will get in touch to figure out what next steps um, we can make available. So we try to make it as, as painless as possible. Um, our goal is to, to make 
to, to not only connect as many people as possible, but really to empower as many people as possible with the information. We really think that information is the most important thing in making sure that you know uh, whether or not you have a record for one. I think a lot of people don't necessarily know that. Um, like Melissa, right? Melissa thought for sure that her record was cleared. I had another client whose case we wrapped up just last year she was 100% convinced that her record was clear. The convictions had happened in the late 70s and early 80s, and she had no reason to think that, the, that there was a record. And when she went for a promotion at work, she was devastated to find out that she had a record. Not only did she not get the promotion, she got harassed at work um, and ended up feeling like she needed to leave um, what was otherwise a really good job. And so the results of not knowing your record can be devastating, and we don't want that. We want you to be empowered with the information so that you can make a decision on your own about what next steps you want to take. It took the it took the um, school uh, six years to get back to me with my fingerprints, even though I gave them all the information that they needed. It still took them six years to do their own investigation and actually say, hey, Melissa, yeah, we want you back to work with the school. Now we got COVID, so I'm not going back to work at the school, but I'll come back when I, it's okay to come back. But I mean, it took six years and I feel awful for that woman that you just spoke of because I know I have a friend who said the same thing. It happened to me, uh, it was, you know, in the 80s, early 90s. It's not there. 10 years have gone by. It's fallen off. And I'm like, no, believe me, you really want to go check. And she's still, she's now she's scared to check. Now, now I've scared her to, to where she won't check. And I'm like, but if you do check, we know where to go to get everything taken care of now. So knowing, knowing first off that you have a record, you know, you definitely got to do that first. And then to get it clear, go go with your gut. Definitely got to go with your gut. I think so many people feel really overwhelmed by it, understandably. And so not knowing sometimes feels a little bit safer than knowing. And I get that. And we want everyone to do it on their own time frame. But I think when you're ready or if you're just you have that nagging feeling that something's not right and, and you want to see if there's help available, I really encourage you to um, to reach out. If you don't want to do it through Survivor Reentry Project from any other way, talk to a local service provider, see how you can go about and get that information. I, I really do believe that knowledge is power in this instance because you can't fix what you don't know um, is a problem. And so uh, these laws are out there. I can tell you right now, not enough people are taking advantage of them. In New Jersey, as busy as we are, we want to be busier because we know that so many people could be helped by clearing their record. Um, and, and so I really, if we leave you with nothing else today, I hope it's it's knowing that, um, you know, Melissa's successful story really can be yours um, in mm -hmm. figuring out how to how to clear up your record. Absolutely, absolutely. Don't 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 let my my story also be yours as to where you think you're moving up in the school, you know, and you're getting a, a great job promotion after promotion just to find out that you do have a record. And now, just like that lady, everybody's gonna talk and and then it's going to be a job that you know you had that you wish you still had I, I mean i would love to be back at the school but with corona i can't but one day one day soon yeah roxy so do we all done. we're happy to take questions if folks have any all right we have a few we have a few questions so the first question is um and i'm speaking from the person's voice, I have a DV charge against my trafficker. Does that fall in the line of expungement or vacatures? How would that? How would this relate to my case? So the answer is the answer that nobody wants, but I'm going to give it anyway because I'm a lawyer. <laughs> the answer is maybe. Um, it's it's very possible. Um, it would be very specific to your individual situation, and so I I would strongly encourage you to get in touch with an attorney. Um, again, we can that's something that we can help try and screen and help um, point you to the right people to help you figure that out at Survivor Reentry Project. But if you have a charge that was connected to your trafficking, we should be evaluating that to see if the relief is available to you. I will say, just to back up, because it occurs to me too that we could be talking about two different things. And so to clarify, if it's a criminal charge, all of this applies to criminal charges. 
Lots of states have other matters that are, um, especially in the domestic violence context, that are more orders of protection or restraining orders. Um, it's the same thing, it just depends on what your state calls them. Those tend to be civil in nature. And so if that's what you're talking about, it gets a little bit trickier because those um, the criminal record clearing is really only for matters that were handled by the criminal court. But even still, I would encourage you to get in touch and see if we can screen that and get you some more information. Okay, great. Um, and I just want to make it clear to everybody that all the resources mentioned, the survivor reentry program, that's going to also be in the handout where you can reach out to them um, whenever you are ready to move on with this process. Um, also, Melissa and Jessica's in contact information is also located in the PowerPoint presentation or handout. Okay, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone understands where to find it. And as you see, it's just popped up on the screen, so you can copy it. And while everybody is copying copying this information, I'm gonna throw out another question. Um, can you speak more about the main vacature bill that was mm, that did not go through last year, and how how could they bring it back? How could survivors work to bring that back? So okay, it seems so there was a bill there was in the state of Maine. In Maine, where there was a vacature bill set to pass, however, it did not go through. So how can survivors um, in this predicament uh, help to push this bill through? Like Melissa uh, did in the great. That's a great question. So I do not have a lot of information where I feel like I could speak um, with any kind of authority about that legislation that didn't go through in Maine. But if whoever asked that question wants to send me an email um, at my email address, jkitson at vljnj.org. It's on the screen, jkitson at vljnj.org. Feel free to shoot me an email um, and ask me that question there. And I will do my best to try and connect you with folks who are working on the ground in Maine on this issue. Okay, are there any more questions? If you have questions, you can click the questions box and type in your questions and I will pass them along to Jessica. Any questions for Melissa, I can pass those down. Um, okay, so it looks like we don't have any more questions. Okay, well, you can get in touch with us anytime. I just wanna, I have to say, I, I know I sound, I'm gonna gush. I just, if you told me, five years ago that Melissa and I would be doing this webinar. I would have cried then and I want to cry now. I, I'm so incredibly grateful for having had the opportunity to work on her case with her. Um, and I just, I know that so many attorneys who get to work with our incredible survivor community feel the same way. It is it's such a gift to us um, and we really want to continue to do anything we can to support all of you. So I hope um, that if you haven't already gotten some help clearing your record and you think you need it, you, you reach out. Um, and I just want to give a huge shout out to Melissa for, for giving me the honor of, of working on her case all those years ago. Well, I just want to say thank you to you for actually taking my case <laughs> and making me feel as comfortable as you did. I don't know. I, it wouldn't have been possible without you guys, I'm telling you. I, I, I'm thankful every day, every single day. My so I'm just glad I was able to help one person. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. So sorry, Melissa, to cut you off. We just got one more question. So my trafficker paid police in courts. How can I trust a lawyer? That is a great question. That's a great and I question. Wish I, had, I wish I had covered it sooner. Melissa, why don't, do you want to talk a little bit about that first? Um, my, my trafficker also paid, um, judges and lawyers. Mm -hmm. I mean, and as you may or may not know from your own experience, those judges and lawyers also paid us. So we never know who we really can trust, but I'm telling you, they are out there for, to help you. They really are. You can trust them. If they are saying that they are there for you, they are there for you, but you have to do the legwork and you have to find, like I said, the ones that you have that connection with they don't they don't pay them all they they, they can't pay them all they don't they don't they can't i also think this is part of why this is part of the impetus behind the survivor reentry project um, and making sure that we have a national coalition working on these issues is to, is because we do understand that that is the history and that is the experience of so many of the survivors who need this help um, is that we want to make sure that we are connecting you not only with 
responsible people, people that we know that we can trust, but it's also a way to make sure that um, you're not paying for it if you don't have to. Um, and so that we're, we really are trying to provide services wherever possible. We can't necessarily do it for everyone, but for the most part, folks are getting access to pro bono services, which means that it's free um, as a way to make sure that folks aren't out there just trying to take advantage and make a buck off of doing this work. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. I wish that I could, you know, say, oh, guarantee you don't have to worry about that. But we, right, we live in the real world and we we all know that. But I can 100% vouch for the Survivor Reentry Project and the partners that we are working with there to say that that is absolutely not something that you have to work about, worry about when you're working with, with attorneys there. Not at all. Not at all. But it's a okay. great question. I really want to thank whoever asked that for, for raising it because I think it's really important that we recognize um, and we do a lot of training, just so you know, too, we are, the attorneys who work with us um, are required to go through some pretty significant training. And a lot of what we want to make sure that they are trained on is recognizing that the experiences that so many survivors have had with the criminal legal system, I won't call it the criminal justice system because it rarely gives justice um, for folks and especially not for the survivors who've been through it, um, is that right? It, it is a system that has let you all down at so many different places. And we want to be really mindful of that and make sure that the attorneys that are working with you are equally mindful of that when they are approaching um, your case and when they are approaching the court systems um, that we file these with. So it's, it's a really wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. And that was one of my fears, to be honest. I, I, didn't, I didn't know where to reach out or how to reach out or I was I was just as scared to think that he had everybody paid because he had big family. I I thought the same thing, I really did. But it was talking to one of the other girls that you know gave me that little extra push. But I I thought the same thing. So it, I I definitely empathize with with the person that asked that question. Okay. All right, I wanna thank everybody so much who came and attended this webinar. Thank you so much, Jessica. Thank you so much, Melissa, for thank agreeing you. to this webinar with us. You guys have given us so much information regarding expungements and vacatures. Um, and I'm sure everybody learned a lot because, I mean, I, I really like the fact that you told us the difference from expungements and vacatures. And then, Melissa, I really appreciate you sharing your experience in regards to what that looked like for you and how you um, gained success overall. And it's really, it's a really, really good thing that uh, there are pro bono lawyers out here who are willing to help. Um, and again, the keyword pro bono, you, you know, you don't need a lot of money, you don't need money at all to get this help. And it's so great that pro bono lawyers during this time they're receiving training to make this process um a more comfortable experience for survivors you know because trust is key trust Just is key, key. Mm -hmm. all right so if there aren't any other questions i hope that everyone has had a chance to um copy melissa and jessica's information um, also, if you haven't, you can take a few more moments to download the handouts. Um, the PowerPoint is attached with the program that Jessica spoke about. Um, and if there aren't any other further questions, um, I will say until next time, thank you so much for everyone for attending and we will see you at our next webinar. Thank you, everybody. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye.